Um, I, I'm Stephen Hay. I'm from the CSS camp. Yes! Ah. So, I didn't get an enthusiastic reaction, which means that most of you are from the JavaScript camp. Probably. Um, I'm going to talk about media queries today. Uh, I'll start off with media queries, but I kind of like the high-level stuff. So I'm going to end with uh, what we, uh, the different ways we as designers and de developers have to think now that we have this thing, the mobile web. Um, I'm not going to do this alone today. I brought someone with me, um, a good friend of mine, so I don't have to do everything myself. And. What you probably notice is that, th this is a fact that we haven't seen in slides yet, 80% of all the developers in mobile today are named Brian. <laughs> so this is Brian Rouser, <laughs> and uh, hi Brian. He's, uh, he's going to help me out today. Brian, Brian's a medium, actually. You, you see these little devils? He's a, he's a spirit medium. So we're going to ask him a couple questions, just query him a bit. So uh, how are you doing today, Brian? Uh, you put on a little weight? Yes. Um, are you lying down? No. OK. So. Um, Brian, uh, just leave us now, if you will, okay? You see that? I always want to use the flames. <laughs> Media queries. This is Brian Rieger's site. Brian Rieger, one of the, the dynamic duo of the web, uh, will be presenting this afternoon. This is uh, Brian and Stephanie's site, and you could just watch what happens as it moves down. Especially when it gets really small, what happens to the type? If we were to refresh right now, you'd get different images. So this is uh, an example of what we're calling responsive design right now. I, call it, I tend to call it adaptive layout, but if you really change uh, the design, then it will be, uh, it, you could call it responsive design. This is Ethan Marcotte, or um, Jesus Christ, as Jeremy Keith calls him. Um, this is his site, and it, it does pretty much the same thing. So you can do a lot. With, this is flexible, uh, it's what Jen talked about, flexible layout, flexible images, and media queries to just adjust one layout to different uh, device width. So I think most of you are familiar with this right now. How many, does everyone use media queries today here? Okay, some, not as many as I expected. Good, so then at least I have a point to doing this whole presentation. Um, let's uh, skip ahead here. Media queries, this is, the, this is the format of a media query. What we have is uh, at media, which is easy enough, uh, an optional not or only, the media type, an optional and, and then ex an expression with a media feature that we're trying to find something out about. And then we put the CSS in between that we want to have work in that instance when the expression evaluates. So uh, it's feature detection, basically, but without JavaScript, which, as we all know, and you from the JavaScript camp will agree with me, that you can't do it right now without JavaScript or something server-side. As a matter of fact, I was talking to Brian uh, yesterday, and we pretty much agree that you have to, the, the server-side camp and the front-end camp, we kind of have to uh, put them together, because you can't do one without the other right now. So it's just um, kind of ridiculous to think that you could do all of this in CSS. So media queries are just, are just one thing to, to use. For those of you who are not familiar with media queries, basically we're talking about the media types. I think everyone knows about this, right? The media types, you used it when you wanted to make a print style sheet. Handheld, uh, which Brian forced me to put in there, is really important. Um, so th this is something we're all familiar with. So to turn that into a media query, it's very simple. We just add a little bit of logic, and it's simple logic, it's just an and in this case. And then we add a feature to query, in this case color. So what this is saying in plain English is just um, if it's a screen media type and has a color screen, then do this CSS. So it's actually very simple. <sighs> 
Okay. Um, we'll talk about <laughs> some more about the logic. Uh, the logical and. This is what we're used to using. Screen and the width, the width is at least 600 pixels, and it's not more than 1,200 pixels. Then do this CSS. So you can see that a media query is very simple, but it can also be very, very, very complicated. And you can apply all these constraints to little pieces of CSS. So even like one list, you can comply, uh, apply ridiculous constraints to a certain situation that you would have to have the list look differently. Um, or have some other kind of CSS. So, and is how we constrain uh, what happens to uh, what CSS gets uh, applied. Then we have the, the or. There's no or. We can't say screen or uh, print. Um, the comma is, is an or, pretty much. So you can have full media queries separated by commas, and if one of these media queries applies, then it evaluates as true, and the CSS will be applied. Okay, so this is uh, something that um, w isn't totally obvious when you when you read the spec, but it it works that way. And we also have the logical not, which is simple, um, not a screen that's a color screen. Okay, the the problem with not is it's kind of confusing because you would expect something like this to evaluate like this, not screen. You would, tend, you would tend to want to put not screen and not min width. In this case, not in media queries works against the entire expression, so it negates the entire rest of your media query. So it'll evaluate like this. Okay, so it's, it's something to be careful with if, if you're not familiar with it. Um, only, this is interesting because uh, you don't want older browsers to look at your media query and just see the media type and then decide it's going to just do all of the it's CSS that you have in there. So you, wanna, you want only browsers that understand CSS3 media queries to evaluate that and then uh, eventually apply the CSS. So this is how you do that. Just put only in front of it and only the newer browsers will, will see it. So there, uh, this is a problem with, for example, Internet Explorer under uh, IE9, but there are, there are ways to solve that, so I'll get to that later. Uh, let's talk about some of the media features because there are these in the spec. And probably most of us focus on these, but there are a lot more. The problem with some of these is that they're actually, originally they were made for print, Opera has a lot to do with the, the editor of the media query spec, is, or at least one of them is uh, with Opera. Um, Opera is doing a lot with paged media and print media. Um, a lot of these have to do with print. So you can see, like, for example, monochrome has to do, well, you could use it for a screen, theoretically, but originally that was for black and white printers. So um, device width and device height, we're not going to really... Um, use right now, and I'll get into why in just a few minutes. Device aspect ratio, we're not going to get into either because, and you're probably not going to use it because you're mostly concerned with the viewport of the browser and not exactly the aspect ratio of the device. Plus, it's uh, not everyone supports it, so. Color, probably don't need for mobile. Uh, um, it, color is a, a weird one anyway because color it has a value. And the value is the amount of bits within a color component. So that means if you have red, green, and blue, and they each have three bits, then the color would be three. So that's, that's kind of a, a hard one to, to figure out. Color index is a little bit easier to figure out because it's just the amount of uh, colors that are in the color index. So that would be uh, like 256 or you know, however, many, however many you want. Monochrome, we probably won't be using for mobile. And uh, resolution, we would like to, maybe, but resolution, just like pixel density, are really hairy problems. And we'll touch on that, but we're not going to talk too much about it today, because that's kind of like hell. Um, scan is for television, so we don't need it. And grid is for um, certain terminals, uh, single font 
devices, uh, which technically you could use Grid for a really, really old telephone like the Nokia that I had in about 99 or 2000. Um, just had one font, you couldn't do anything with it, just a black and white screen. And uh, it would be great if those old devices supported <laughs> this so they don't. Um, so pretty much you can't use it. These are the ones you're probably going to use, and I think aspect ratio is something you won't use as much. And most of the time, you're just going to stick with these, okay? So it doesn't, it's not all that complicated right now, but it's, it is interesting to know that there are more features that people want to be able to test for, but it doesn't always work. Okay, so there are uh, some tests that we're running. Um, I found no media query tests, and I decided to write some. PPK uh, said, well, I'm interested in that because I have all these compatibility tables, so uh, maybe we can um, work something out. Matthias Bynens and Steve Souders came up to me during the conference and said, oh, you have to put that in browser scope, and really cool stuff, so they uh, were w working on that last night. We're not quite done with it, but when we are, I'll publish a, a link, and everyone can just go with whatever browser you're using to this page and we'll be just collecting all the results, and then we'll be posting them. Well, PPK will post them as in his uh, compatibility tables, and then you'll know exactly which features are supported on all these different platforms. So I hope we can get that uh, finished within the next week or so. Okay, so, um, yeah, he's, uh, he's talking about my preference for the Opera browser, which actually... Um, supports almost everything, which is kind of logical, I guess, if you're if the, someone who works at Opera is uh, the editor of the spec. But uh, Opera supports pretty much uh, all, the, all the features that we were, that we were talking about um, earlier. So there are some prefixed features, just like we have all these transitions and things that are coming from WebKit. We also have things coming from WebKit and Mozilla for media queries. Um, like, what, let's say you want to know how many device pixels there are in a CSS pixel. That's a whole other discussion about why do we have device pixels and CSS pixels. For the people who don't know, a CSS pixel is when you say, I want something to be 10 pixels wide, you want it to be 10 pixels wide. A device pixel would say, well, f because we, have, we want a really nice screen and we have all these uh, really, really small pixels, if you make something 10 pixels, you're, it's going to look like you know, one, one pixel or two or three, so they, you have to map the one to the other. So if you wanted to know that, which is, I don't even know if we want to, to know that, but if you wanted to, then these are the different uh, proposals right now. Device pixel ratio, and for WebKit, Opera, and Mozilla, um, you could do it this way. Um, it'll look like this. This is interesting. Um, I didn't know about this until, uh, I guess, yesterday that I was talking to Andreas from, from Opera about it. They use an actual ratio, which seems logical, right? But everyone else uses a, a number. So 1.5, what does that mean exactly? Well, in the Android documentation, it means that it's a high-density device. So good luck with that. <laughs> um, this, um, th this sounded logical last night, and now I don't even remember. <laughs> what it was. So maybe if Andreas is here, he could um, say something about it in the in the Q and A. But I I swear it really is logical. <laughs> um, the point is that a pixel is not a pixel, and I'm not going to talk too much about resolution and and pixel density because PPK thought it would be a wonderful uh, thing to discuss in his next talk, and I'll just go ahead and leave him to that. <laughs> Um, this is an interesting one from Mozilla, which is weird because they're not really um, a very big player, at least not yet, uh, on mobile. So um, you might want to find out with CSS if something's touch enabled or not so that you can do something like, uh, like this. Um, someone mentioned yesterday, I want my buttons to be different if it's, a, you know, I want certain links or something to be different because it's a touch device. Um, this is how you could potentially do that. It's just not really supported in anything but, but Firefox right now. So, um, since we can't, uh, since we, we can't look at the device all the time, we, what are we focused on as designers is the viewport, 
the thing that we see the, that the web page or the application page is, is in. Um, if we use device width, that's a problem. And the problem is, well, first of all, you never get back exactly what the device width is all the time. But the second problem is that uh, mobile uh, manufacturers and the browser makers are ahead of us because they realize that about 99% of all sites that are in existence are not optimized for mobile, they're not ready for mobile. So how do you handle that? You shrink it down and you allow people to zoom. That's, that's the way it works if you don't do anything to a website. So how do they do that? The viewport, and for those of you who are familiar with a lot of CSS frameworks, like that would be uh, 960 framework and those things that tends to gravitate around uh, from between 800 and 1,000, those are pretty much based off of standard viewports. So what these browsers do is they shrink the viewport down so that you can zoom back up <laughs> as, a, as a mobile user. If you test for a device width, um, this is the device width, what's going to happen is that you're going to change all your styles. You're going to say, if the device width is 320 pixels, then I want this div to be 80% uh, of that. What's going to happen is going to be 80% of 320 pixels. Since the viewport gets shrunk down, it's going to shrink the viewport down, and that 320 pixels is a portion of your page, and that 80% that you thought would be 80% of the device width is now 80% of what, probably a third of your page on the mobile site, and you'll have to zoom up anyway. And that's not the case on all, uh, all devices and all browsers, but it is the case in a lot of them. So what we want to do is we want to tell the uh, browser what to do with the viewport. We want to set the viewport to those 320 pixels, for example. And we do that with Meta Viewport. And Meta Viewport looks like this, and probably uh, many of you are familiar with this. Um, very simple. Um, take the viewport and make the width of the viewport the same as the device width. The device width is still the width that the, that the browser or the manufacturer thinks is the good width to tell you about the device width, but that's okay, because now at least you know what you're working within. Okay, so you would combine a media query with that, and then you know that this 80% is going to be 80% of, uh, of the, the device width that you got, which might not be 320 pixels, but it'll be less than that. So at least you'll have something that, that looks the way it should on your screen. If you want the user to scale, which is probably always a good idea, um, then you would put this in there, which says it's 100% it's right now, and the user can zoom, and they can zoom out, they can zoom in. So this is a good thing to, to set it at. Um, this just it does nothing other than allow the user to zoom. If you were to leave this out, you can see it on the mobilism side, it's left out by mistake, but um, then you can't zoom. Luckily, the text is big enough for most people, but if you're a low vision user and you have trouble with it, you can't, you can't do anything with it. So that, that could be a usability problem. Um, this is interesting. Uh, it was talked to, touched on a couple times. Opera had a proposal to get viewport out of HTML and into CSS, which I think is not uh, not a bad idea. And you put zoom on here. I don't know how Internet Explorer is going to handle this one. <laughs> so that will will I think there's some thinking that'll have to be done about that. But uh, this does the same thing as the as the meta element that we just saw. Okay. So. Um, how do we apply these things? Here's where I want to start kind of a, a war between the performance people and the normal people. <laughs> you could put the media queries in blocks in CSS, and here it comes. You can put them in like this, and you know what this means right away. More hits, right? More requests. Um, we'll get back to that in a minute. And you could also use app import. You know, no one does that, but you can. Um, let's look at that for a second. This is, uh, this is the Mobilism site. And under it is the site of uh, Yibu, uh, the Riegers uh, company. They're pretty similar, uh, slightly different, but 
fairly similar. There's a, there's a base style sheet which applies to any screen or handheld. And that's just uh, basically color, type. I don't know if Brian's in here, but um, Brian, are you here? Okay, Is it, do you have anything other than color and type in there? Okay, okay. <laughs> So basically color and type, which you know, it'll, it, it might get too wide, it, get, it might get too thin, but basically that'll work almost everywhere. It's just your content with, uh, with a font and, and some colors added to it. Um, and then uh, from uh, up to 600 pixels in mobilism case, and uh, here between 320 and 640, you're adding some new styles, you're doing some, some new things to it. Here you see that we're taking these, these styles and putting them in for an Internet Explorer um, in, in a conditional comment. And why do we do that? Because Internet Explorer doesn't, exp uh, doesn't support these media queries and you want, um, you want them to get the normal experience instead of a normal desktop with uh, just fonts and colors changed. You just put these same ones in a, in a conditional comment and then Explorer gets those style sheets and they're there's basically no problem. The problem is that um, the performance guys who, who see this, and yesterday uh, I was running through this with someone who said, uh, I, let me go back here. I said, well, which one, is, uh, which one is the best one? He said, you're gonna, you're gonna say which one is best, right? I said, yeah, that one. He said, no, that one. I said, no, that one. <laughs> So we had, <laughs> we had this thing, and this is something I hope comes up in the Q&A, because I'd like to get some performance people and, um, and someone else who knows a lot about this to talk about it. Um, this is interesting, because what we want is that only in a certain instance, like in this case, that the, this media query applies, you want that style sheet to be loaded at that time. That's what you ideally want. So basically, on the really, really small screens, you would only get one style sheet. I think that's the way it should work. Apparently, Opera thinks that's the best way it should work because they, that's how it works in Opera now. It doesn't work like that in, in a lot of other browsers. So that's unfortunate because right now you're doing more requests. But I would want to see it as a browser bug, actually, and have everybody just fix that. Um, just download the style sheets you need. Why do we have to um, combine these when the whole idea of a media query is to, uh, to separate things? And you could do it in one style sheet. Uh, we're running tests to see if there's a difference, really, if there are some user agents that, that will accept it this way, but won't accept all those queries in, uh, within uh, one style sheet. Right now, they all seem to do the same thing, so it's okay. But one problem would be nesting. A lot of people ask the question, can we nest media queries? You can't. You can't just put a media query in, in, in Dent and then another media query. But you can if you do it like this. In this style sheet, I can have other media queries, and that'll work just fine. So it's kind of a roundabout form of nesting that you can do. And it just kind of keep things, it keeps things simple because you have all the style she sheets uh, separated. So. This is a little bit about media queries. One of the important things about media queries is that you don't always need them. You don't always need to do a responsive design. There was a lot of talk about Joshua Davis, the big flash guy from uh, way back when. Um, he had this new site and it used standards and it was, uh, wow, it was fantastic and responsive. It is responsive in the sense that if it's a smaller screen that it, it acts somewhat differently than in a larger screen. Actually, it doesn't really. You j it just show it's just a float thing, a float layout. So it's a good job. I think it's great that like people from Flash are, are doing stuff like this, but um, you don't necessarily need them. And if you have a flexible layout and you think it through really well, uh, you'll get by with very few media queries, if any at all. This is the kind of thing that we'd like to avoid. Um, with all due respect to people who work on Adapt.js, that um, they're trying to help, and I think I think anyone who's trying to help is doing a good job. The only problem would be here: you've got these basic things, and the whole idea of these guys is, hey, we're going to put something out there, and people can use it, tailor it to their own needs. But in practice, with boilerplate. Uh, 
things and frameworks and stuff like that, uh, uh, people tend to see, hey, the, the, the step to getting to where I want to go is, is lower, so I could just grab this, throw it in my site, not think about it, and then you have, uh, in this case, six different, um, six different media queries, or six different CSS files as well. And the first one is called mobile. I don't know about that either, but uh, what's mobile? You know, we were talking about it. Mobile, just so you know, is when you're actually running to the train. That's, that's mobile. And, well, um, Stephanie said it well yesterday. She said, well, it is. Uh, that is the case, unless it's not. <laughs> so, that's... Uh, <laughs> This one, fluid CSS. So that means that our design only gets fluid once it gets to uh, 1920 pixels. See, so these are kind of things that are, they're subtle, but I think they're, they can be dangerous in the sense that people think that the, the small sh style sheets are only for mobile, um, that you're always moving around on mobile. I use my phone most of the time while I'm sitting down anyway. So um, this is a lot. And what are these, what are these pixel units anyway? Uh, very important is that you don't just go from one device size to the next device size because uh, as soon as you have the iPhone size, Apple's going to come out with a new one, and then you're going to, you know, you're going to have to go back and revisit all that. So you really have to think about this stuff very carefully. Um, this is something I've said in the last three talks I've, I've given, and since this relates to layout, I'll say it again. The layout is not design. Design is, uh, design is uh, this, actually. The art of putting form and content together. So it's not form, it's not content, it's the art of putting those together. That's design. Um, we're talking mostly about layout here. Design is a much broader uh, perspective. So. What, what we want to do is think about uh, the media query as just one small tool in the, in the toolbox. We're, we're going to use it sometimes, but we're only going to use it when the, when the screw demands it, <laughs> to be honest. So uh, layout is one component. I wrote a, a manifesto a while back about, uh, about meaningful design and the components of design, which are for most designers, I guess, layout, imagery, type, and um, I forgot the other one. <laughs> so uh, it's just one thing. That's, that's the important thing to, to remember. So for designers it's, uh, and developers, we're, going into, we're coming into a new uh, age, and it's exciting, really. It's kinda, it kind of feels like, I don't know if all of you are, uh, were around doing websites when around 92, 93, when we just started uh, doing all the CSS stuff, and um, even before that, actually, uh, accessibility and stuff like that. It's the, the excitement that you have that you don't know everything yet, and no one knows it yet, and you're all trying to work together to figure this stuff out, and it keeps the... the it, I think uh, someone said to me the other day, uh, you could stay doing this same job for the rest of your life and it would always be exciting because it changes so much. And this is like a big change because we're doing, we're revisiting all the things that we've talked about um, like 10 years ago. It's just the same thing all over again. It's progressive enhancement, really is one of the big things we're talking about. Uh, yesterday, um, Anthony's uh, presentation, he was talking about accessibility. So it's, it's the same thing all over again. It's actually fantastic. So we've gone from designing pages. A lot of designers went from pages. We started thinking in terms of components on pages. We had to, because we had all these CMSs that we had to, to use. So you're thinking in terms of components. Um, depending on the CMS, you're either doing it um, in a way which helps you or a way which hinders you, but now we're trying to go toward uh, designing systems, which is uh, what all good design is, basically, is designing a system. When you design a logo, you don't only design a logo. I've had people come up to me and say, can you design me a logo? I've got a budget of like, you know, $300, uh, um, which is pretty good, I think. Uh, they thought. <laughs> So the, the reason you read about all these big corporate uh, branding projects that cost uh, sometimes millions or hundreds of thousands of dollars is because you never make just a logo. You have to figure out where the logo is going to go. It's going to go on, on your envelopes, it's going to go on your business cards, it's going to be on signage, it's going to be on your, um, 
all the vehicles that you use in your car park or whatever. So um, you have to think about what it, what it does on textile, what it does on paper, what it does on metal, what, it, uh, what colors do you need, because there are different color systems, because the, the graphics world has just as many standards problems as we do. So all of these things make designing systems very complicated, and I think we try to avoid complicated things. And in trying to avoid complicated things, we make things very, very complicated. So um, we need to think simply about designing systems. And it's possible to do that now with mobile because it's easier to visualize. Everyone knows what wireframes are, right? You've all seen them. Do any, anyone make wireframes themselves? OK. And how many get wireframes and they have to do something with them? <laughs> Okay, about the same amount, yeah. What's gonna happen now? We have these kind of wireframes. We've got wireframe toolkits and everyone's all cool on the tools. What, what are we gonna do now? Make 25 different wireframes for one page just because we have to show what it looks like in every single device? An iPad wireframe, iPhone wireframe, Blackberry wireframe. It's um, not only annoying to do, I, it's job security you know, <laughs> but um, you get this kind of thing too, because it's cool, you know, people are, a lot of us got into the industry because of the cool tools, and if, uh, I've been to a lot of universities, uh, and they've, they've got uh, the, the courses, it amazes me, they don't learn HTML, really, or CSS, they learn tools, you know, they're talking about Photoshop, and, and TextMate, and, well, not even TextMate, it's more like, uh, I guess, the more semi-WYSIWYG type of things that they're, that they're still using. So, and, and this kind of thing, like OmniGraffle templates with uh, all these things, they look really cool and it's fun and you think you can work really quickly. Um, and that's great. And then you have one thing for one device. That's not the way that we're trying to think now. It's not, a, it's not really a, an effective way to think right now. So my proposal would be to go back, if you, if you ever did it this way, to uh, content reference wireframing, which is very simple. You have a huge uh, inventory of content and functionality that you want in the site. You're not really concerned with what it looks like, and you name these, these things, they're objects. It's pretty much an index of, of uh, you have got a, a block list of, of news items. You've got a, a profile block. You've got a login uh, block. You've got all these little blocks and pieces, like Lego. Um, Aryan said that to me uh, yesterday, two days ago. It's, it's kind of like Lego. So you label these things, and your wireframe is just a reference wireframe. So it's a simple diagram that you could put together in about 30 seconds to a minute to see if you think that it will work layout-wise, and you reference the, the things in your um, content inventory. So it's still about content and not about trying to do a layout, because designers get really pissed off if you give them a wireframe like the one that, that we just saw, because they're like, what do I have to do? You know, it's already designed. All I have to do is put color on it and a logo on it, and I'm done. So, uh, and then you get this kind of tension between um, the the wireframers camp and the, and the designers camp. So you could do it this way. The problem is, and which I'm sure is popping up in some heads right now, is uh, how do we present that to the client? Because the client pretty much wants us to make the whole application before we've made it to see if they like it and want to pay us. Um, I don't know. The, the, what we did was we made this type of thing in HTML, and we just had little functions to call up pieces out of the content inventory. It was really simple. We did it with, with PHP. Um, uh, one of the employees at Cinnamon, where I used to work, uh, came up with that. And if we wanted a list of news items with photos, then photos was just a parameter that you can plug into the function and it would, you could put, uh, another parameter was how many, how many items you wanted in the list. So you could put together a page that looked kind of like a page using a fake or uh, indication content inventory which was just like pulled into these arbitrary templates. And then you have like instant wireframe and it's already in HTML and if you did the HTML correctly for, for the, um, the underlying structure, you could already show what it'll do on, on a mobile device. So it's not hard to do, it's just simple making functions in PHP and including. Um, and you could do it in any language, and I'm sure there are a lot of smart people who could think up 
much better ways to do it. Um, but it's probably more effective than sitting down in a, in a graphics program and dragging all these elements. And what happens when the client says, uh, well, it's the same problem with Photoshop templates. Uh, I, want, I want all of the headlines to be um, slightly bigger and green. God. You know, you gotta go through by hand and move everything. That's just, it's just not the way to work. That's not what we have computers for. Another thing we can use uh, is breakpoint graphs. And this is something that needs a lot of thinking. A breakpoint graph is just a timeline with some points in there that you, um, in this case, just arbitrary, 600 and 900 pixels. W what are these values? Why are you choosing them? These are things that have to be uh, thought about by doing what we used to do all the time, have a, a desktop browser support profile. We're going to support these browsers. Uh, we want to make sure that the experience is OK in other browsers, and we'll talk about how to do that. But you need to do it for mobile as well. So uh, how am I doing on time? Whoa, OK. Um, this is the cool part, the first part. We don't have to do anything, really, to the first, till the first breakpoint except maybe some color and type. That's the base.css that we were talking about. This is fantastic because you, you, uh, it's, the, it's what Luke's talking about for the ca past couple of years of, of mobile first. So you just have your content. If you turned off all styles and just looked at plain HTML, what it does then is what it'll do in a mobile browser. And if you just look at that and let it do what it does and just slightly tweak it, until it looks the way you want in, in the smallest denominator uh, browser that you, that you have, then you have this part right there. And you can't go wrong because almost everyone who has the stupidest device and the stupidest browser that you can think of will at least be able to get your content. Now, there is a distinction, I know, between um, documents and applications. That's the kind of discussion that's happening right now, but um, we won't get into that discussion. Just ignore the fact that I'm right for a couple minutes and um, just go along with it. <laughs> so we get this. Let's say it's a linear layout. It doesn't always have to be linear, but let's just say it is. And then it gets a little bit more complicated, which it doesn't have to. We don't have to get all complicated just because we're on the desktop. And the the cool thing is that in between these breakpoints, if you want to do it this way, the best way to do it is to be fluid in between the breakpoints. So you don't just want to have a bunch of breakpoints and have static layouts, because on some device, you're going to end up having to scroll horizontally. So this is pretty much how you, how you want to do it. And this is interesting here. We don't know how big these things are going to get, because we're focusing on the small, but things are getting bigger as well. So. Um, to do this, and I'll have to hurry it up a little bit, but uh, there are some, you want order independent layout mechanisms because if you have a source code which follows a, a certain order, and that's not necessarily the order that you want it presented in, even on a small device, then you're going to have to have something that allows you to do a different layout. So there are a few uh, tools for that. It's a little bit of code. I tried not to make it too complicated because I know there are people who are not coders here. Uh, this is pretty simple enough. Um, just a couple of articles, basically, on a page. New sports and entertainment. By default, this is how it would show up on a page. Whether it's desktop or mobile, it would just, they would just be one right after the other. Okay. But let's say we wanted, for a certain layout, we wanted this. We could use flexible box layout module, um, which is uh, supported now in the current draft is supported in WebKit and uh, Mozilla browser. So um, you could play with it. I use the syntax of the newest drafts, which totally changes everything. So, you know, <laughs> just to, to give you, it's like teasing you, you know. Here, you can use this. No, you can't. <laughs> But you could try it. You could try it out. The the other spec works just fine. It works fantastic, as a matter of fact. But what we're saying here basically is go from left to right. This is the flex direction, um, and put sports first. Put news and entertainment second. But when doing that, it'll take because these are in the you know, flex order group, the second group. It'll then put those second, but it'll also follow the order that it is in the source. So news comes before entertainment, and that's the case here as well. So it just puts sports first, basically. Um, 
what we're also saying is this has a certain amount of available space and we want that we want to share that the the two first items uh, sports and entertain or news to share that available space evenly amongst themselves so this takes that the first example that we just saw and turns it into a horizontal layout without floats. If we wanted to go back to this, where sports was first, all we had to do was change one thing. Instead of LR for left to right, it's TB for top to bottom. And then you get this layout. And you still have a, a changed uh, order. Okay? So take a, a more realistic example. This is probably a basic page for for a lot of blogs, I guess. Uh, a header, a sidebar, the main content area, and a footer. Would look like this. Notice something here? This is already just fine for a lot of mobile devices if it's just a plain old site. You don't really have to do anything with it at all, except for some basic styles. So if you wanted to change that, you could use the, the new, very new, grid layout module. Um, Kind of looks like tables, right? Microsoft wrote it. So, <laughs> um, lucky that they took one of the the better uh, proposals as a, an extra alternative syntax. Uh, but this is um, this is what you could do with this. Basically, you're saying I have two columns and three rows. I'm putting a header uh, at, um, across the top, and I'm just positioning everything like this. So it looks a lot like tables work. Um, it's hard to, hard to write this. I don't, I don't like that. I was a big fan of the template layout module, still am, and luckily uh, Microsoft was kind enough to pull in that syntax as well, where you could basically imply two columns by putting two of these names next to each other. The cool thing about this uh, draft is that you can, you can name something whatever you want. If you want to use the, the grid templates, you have to use letters for names but you can map those to an actual name if you want. But this is a lot simpler, and what we're saying here is header, the content, and then the side next to it, and then the footer on the bottom, and then uh, we're telling it what it's gonna do. The, the FR, that's a fractional width, just kind of expands and contracts. So you could just say, header goes into cell H, et cetera, et cetera. It works really well. It seems, a lot, uh, it seems a lot like tables still, but once, once you decide to do something like this within a media query, then you see how powerful this gets. Let's say that your designer was smoking crack and he wanted the footer on top. Then you could. You could do this, okay? Yeah. <laughs> so what we've talked about to sum up is uh, media queries and meta viewport. Hopefully you'll learn, you'll right now use them together. Just declare your uh, viewport and then use media queries. Use fluid layouts. Um, build up device and browser support profiles so that you at least know how to figure out your breakpoints. Um, use content reference wireframing and also um, breakpoint graphs. And eventually, very soon, and you can even play with them now, you'll be able to use the, the new layout mechanisms. Okay? So, uh, the whole idea now is to think in terms of design principles and systems not being so rigid and in, in everything has to be pixel perfect. You're going to think more proportionally that how, how things relate to one another on a page. And it's funny that Jen said that. Just let it go, especially in the beginning. Start from the bottom, see what happens to your content, and just kind of tweak that uh, going forward. And try to, try to help out with this thing. Now that we have these new, these complicated ways of, uh, of doing things with mobile and all these different views, ways of viewing something, how do you communicate this to clients? How do you, in a, within a big company, have the designers communicate this to the developers? Or probably even harder, the developers who probably know more of this stuff. How do you get that, them to communicate that to designers and how can you all work together to, to, um, to get to something that, um, that's worthwhile?
Okay? So, that was it. Thank you. In, a, in about, within one hour, I'll have these on SlideShare. Um, the, uh, instead of just putting a bunch of links on the screen, I just made a delicious uh, tag for it, so you can go here and, and see some articles that I've uh, picked out for you. Um, go there quick, because you never know what's going to happen to delicious. <laughs> okay, and I'm Stephen Hay on Twitter, so you can pretty much find anything from there. Thank you. Do we have any questions or war things? No? Okay, sorry, couldn't see. Question as always. Um, so I'm thinking, so since fluid layouts and adaptive design, so when the screen side changes, you have many si sites which use grid systems like 916. Yeah. So, well, I feel it isn't the best way to go to use grid systems if you want to approach, you know, mobile responsive design, right? So you should mm -hmm. go with some maybe percentages or, yeah. you know, some fixed width by, adapted by uh, the media queries rather than grid systems. So if we have customers who insist, of, for example, on usage of grid systems and they also insist on mobile versions, so this is some kind of conflict, right? I don't see that, it, well, if you mean grid systems like grid frameworks, like yeah, like 960. Yeah, exactly. Uh, exactly. I don't I don't like frameworks. Uh, I've never liked them, and I've had a lot of fights with people about it. I don't like them because uh, they assume things, and most people don't use a framework as what it's for. CSS is a framework, actually. It should be your framework. So what you'll do is you'll look at your project and you'll design a grid for that project. But the grid doesn't have to be something with. Um, um, UE 5.1 X span 5, you know, it could just be something that you, that you made up specifically for that project. You'll figure out ways to re, uh, recycle that kind of thing in code. I mean, people are worrying about recycling, but you, re you rewrite so much for a project anyway to tailor it to your project. I think that if you design a grid which is proportional, which changes um, up into a breakpoint where you might have to choose a new grid, that's, I think a breakpoint is actually where you decide, okay, the grid that I'm using, the flexible grid I'm using, w is not going to work anymore. So now I'm going to um, now I'm going to choose a different grid for that. And that's a system. That's a grid system. Yeah. So uh, you're adjusting actually the the width of the modules in the grid yeah. system. Yeah. And what Ethan does is he's using all percentages. Our MC uh, Facilius it, it uses M's. Uh, there are arguments for M's because per, uh, if you've ever done testing of percentages on different browsers, it's totally different. They're, they're a lot different. And that's why Ethan go, has these huge numbers, because they kind of even the playing field a little bit. But they both... Yeah, the, what? Yeah, they do. No, they don't? <laughs> Opera doesn't understand um, decimals in percentages, in widths. There you go. It's hell. Yeah. All over again. <laughs> Other questions? I don't have a book to give. Sorry about that. I know that's why I'm not getting any questions. Then. <laughs> uh, my question is, uh, are there any mobile browsers out there that uh, will apply any CSS within media queries uh, and ignoring uh, width and other uh, constraints? Um, not that I know of, that, that, that apply media queries but ignore width? Um, that ignore the, um, the constraint, but, uh, but will apply the, um, uh, the CSS within I the query. I think we came across it in a couple older browsers, really, really old ones, and not mobile. Um, but I, I don't know. That, see, we're still running those tests. So. Yeah, I, I thought uh, uh, NetFront and browsers like that yeah, if I look at PPK's table right now, then you could see the the red flags. Uh, yeah, NetFront has often a lot of red flags. <laughs> yep. Um, I, I, the thing is, um, uh, to tell a browser doesn't support media queries can mean both behaviors, uh, ignoring everything it doesn't know and um, executing stuff that it shouldn't. 
Okay, I think I, I think I know what you're getting at, that you don't want to have a media query. Um, you only want the browsers that understand that to be able to do everything in it. Am I right? Um, no, not quite. Um, <laughs> I, I just want to know if... I'm, it, I'm if, stupid if, this morning. <laughs> no, my, my English is that bad, I think. Um, I just wanted to know if it's risky if, if, if I have to um, consider browsers that uh, apply styles that they should not apply. If you want to be sure, then you have to use only in front of uh, the query for, that contains the styles that you want. Then you, then you can be absolutely positive that it will only apply if the browser supports that. So that's, that's really the only way to do it. The only way to do it is <laughs> only. Okay, yeah. thank you. Okay. Hi, Stephen. Um, I was wondering why it is exactly that oh, okay. in uh, certain fluid uh, style sheets where you're, you're, you're computing your width and percentages, and Ethan's examples have this too, why are there sometimes up to like 10 points or numbers after the decimal? It seems like there's no way you would ever need to be that accurate. I'm just kind of curious. Um, I, I've heard that most only go to three. I, I haven't talked to Ethan yet about why he does that. I, I don't know if he just uh, like calculates it and just plugs the whole number in there or, um, or what. So I, I wouldn't know. I'll, I will be sure to ask him though. Or you can ask him. <laughs> I'm sorry, I don't, I don't know. Sorry? The performance people would maybe disagree with the whole bunch of numbers. So. <laughs> yeah. I'm sure they would. <laughs> so it's it's not a battle with performance people, really. So we're all trying to do the same thing. So I I learned a lot last night with Steve and uh, and Matthias there. There. So um, other questions? No no wars about performance at all. Nothing. You mentioned earlier that there are browsers who um, actually download, you know, the, the whole CSS, the whole list of CSS files. Yeah, and most actually. Yes, unfortunately. And um, how do you, do you have any suggestion about solving that? Because, you know, you could do the whole server side detection and you're good. Yeah. And then you ignore media queries. But if you want to use media <coughs> queries, what do you do? Well, you do what Brian didn't do, <laughs> and that's uh, server-side media queries. No, I, um, I think right now you'll have to do, uh, y you'll have to either d detect in ways that you normally wouldn't want to detect, and then apply a style sheet that way. Um, uh, I would say I would encourage the browser makers to just go ahead and implement it the way that Opera has done. And I know that if you want to make a site right now, then you'll just have to, you'll have to use uh, some kind of other uh, detection for that. Um, or just go ahead and take the risk of having a much larger CSS file. Um, right, but for mobile, that is not an option because we're all focusing on, you know, um, a, a, a very uh, short load time, uh, performance and everything. Yeah. Yeah, well, I, I think then you'll, ju you'll just end up having, in some cases, you're going to have to, uh, um, you, you'd rather do feature detection through media queries, but you'll have to use another method of feature detection with JavaScript or and a combination of, of server uh, things. Like Scott's going to be talking about some cool hybrid stuff about uh, server and client things that you can do. So I think you'll have to do that in the, in the meantime, just a combination of, of both and not... Not media queries. Well, what we do is just go ahead and uh, use more files. Uh, I mean, I know it's kind of evil, but they're small files, and it's not that evil. <laughs> well, small files add up at some point. Yeah, they do. They're, they're more requests, I know. Requests, requests. But um, I, I think uh, if you have, if you, what most people do is they would have one large CSS file and have all the queries in there, and that's fine too, but a pretty large CSS file, um, yeah, it, it, I guess it'd be about the same. I don't know, I don't know, I'd like to hear people's thoughts like in the, in the lunch break or something about what two extra 
requests are really going to do for your mobile experience. And it might be for like mobilism, it might not matter, but I'm sure it does matter for like a huge company. And then you'll have to, you'll probably have to do some server side uh, detection. And there's no way around it, I guess. So. Well, yes. Absolutely. When, when it comes to commercial website and you have loads of customers and you rely on mobile performance, then yeah. you, you have to go server side. Yeah, then you pretty much have to listen to everything that Steve says and do all of it. If you're, if you're really looking for revenue, and it, I'm, I'm kind of, the, some of the stuff I'm saying is more out of principle, how I think it should be, than how you should really do it in, in practice. So. Okay. Yeah, okay. There's one uh, back there. Oh. Yeah. I already got a mic. Um, okay. I, j I just want uh, to elaborate on the statement you just uh, said uh, about downloading large files versus multiple small ones. And we are currently also doing a lot of performance testing on that. Um, but especially on mobile, uh, we see that uh, downloading, for instance, three uh, very small files is way and way more uh, heavy than downloading uh, one single large file, okay. uh, basically because the latency is always the bottleneck on uh, mobile. Right. Okay. Thanks. <laughs> Thanks for confirming that. <laughs> uh, hi. Um, I just want to confirm that browser vendors are already working on this. So they are like WebKit is already verifying if there's a media query, and then it won't like load two images that you defined like in one media query and in the like all media query. And so I think Mozilla is also working on this. And probably Opera, I don't know, but uh, they are they are they are aware of that. And uh, so you think they're going to all end up uh, doing it that way? Yeah, all of the course. browsers. Yeah, okay. it is. A, it is a browser bug. Well, good. I feature. hope so. And they are fixing it. Yeah, I hope so. That's great. So. Thanks. Anything else? No. Oh yeah, it's lunchtime. <laughs> all right. Have a good lunch. <laughs>